Here is China, cradle of civilization in Asia, homeland of 450 million human beings, more than one-fifth of the population of the Earth. Like our own America, China is a vast and beautiful country with wide extremes of climate and contour. One of the most colorful types of Chinese sport and pageantry is the Dragon Boat Festival. The history of this goes back to ancient times, and various stories seek to explain its origin. One popular version says that a renowned poet statesman drowned himself in the river as a protest against corrupt government, and his friends set out in their boats to recover his body. Each year on the anniversary of his death, they went to the river again to call up his spirit to witness that they were true to the cause for which he died. But today, the Dragon Boat Festival survives as a race between long canoes, some of them manned by as many as 70 men. Each community along the river has its entry, and the townsfolk come along to cheer the competitors. Sometimes, the rivers of China turn unkind, and the disaster of flood visits the countryside. In the past, millions of lives and billions in property values have been destroyed by the waters. But in the future, modern engineering will control these rivers for the safety and the service of the people. This is just another of the many big tasks of peacetime for which the government and people are now preparing even while they carry on the long, bitter struggle for freedom. China has been called the sleeping giant because it clung to the ways of the past while the younger civilizations of Europe and America embarked on the Industrial Revolution. But in the years following 1911, when the reign of the Manchu emperors was ended, China began to relax its old rigid tradition of farm and village culture and to emerge into the modern world. This progress was slowed down by the civil wars that were the birth pangs of the new republic. But the Industrial Revolution had begun, and the Chinese were showing a natural aptitude for the use of the machine. The great seaport of Shanghai was a center of this new industrial life. Shanghai was first attacked by the Japanese in 1932, a year after their seizure of Manchuria. And from then on, the Chinese worked rapidly to build the wealth and the productive power which they knew they would need to withstand the inevitable assault on China proper. On the home front, had some residential sections like this were constructed. Modernization was consequently in every phase of life, particularly in the larger cities along the seacoast. Strange new scenes for ancient China. Public health clinics were opened, 
the best of modern medicine came to China and was welcomed by government and people. Popular education was spreading. Young China was going to school. James Yen, who had studied in America and gone home to China, started his great mass education movement. Working with the government, he devised a sort of basic Chinese from his country's complicated picture language. And even young children found they could master this. After they learned the shapes of the characters, the actual writing is greatly simplified. This pretty little girl seems to be having no trouble. China was building strong minds and strong bodies, aware of the importance to the nation of a vigorous and informed youth. Here's a young fellow who means business. The life of young people in the large cities is much like ours here in America. It was for China a renaissance, a swift but ordered march into the modern world. A remarkable achievement for a people that had always held the ways of the past in deepest reverence. Here are examples of the young men and women the colleges were producing. Fine representatives of new China, studying the arts of peace. But peace was not on the program of the ambitious rulers of the island empire across the China seas. Suddenly, in 1937, the Japanese struck on a vast scale, and China's battle for its life began. Then, different scenes. Defenseless, unoffending people fleeing from the horrors of total war. Fifty millions of people like these were the victims. Up and down the land of China, they were driven from their homes, separated from their loved ones. And each one who survived had a story of terror and death to tell. Those who escaped were the lucky ones. For behind them, the survivors of bomb and bullet were either slaughtered or enslaved. China had so many Coventries, so many Leditzes, that had long ago lost count of them. Individuals lost everything, and the nation, faced with total war, had lost more than 70% of its industrial capacity to make the tools and munitions of war. Such a vast displacement of population paralyzed the transportation systems. In the confusion, it soon became a matter of every person for himself as the people sought what safety there was in the interior. Millions that the bombs did not kill died of starvation. And those were indeed fortunate who found strength in the rice bowl to struggle on. These are China's orphans, the orphans of the war. Many thousands of them today are in the friendly haven of the orphanages supported through Unite in a Relief. Thus began the greatest mass migration in modern history. Millions of people took to the roads and the hills rather than stay at home and bow their heads before the invader. They came flocking into the undeveloped interior, where there was no work for them, where there were appalling scarcities of goods and food. Out of this bitter necessity came a brilliant plan and program, today known all over the world as the Chinese Industrial Cooperative Movement. Here, the refugees register for food and a job in the workshops. 
the cooperatives set up their first meager equipment in small units in the walls of cities, in caves in the hills, under trees, or wherever shelter could be found from the weather and from roving Japanese bombers. Often they had to use century-old methods for lack of modern tools. Thousands of women rallied to spin and weave army blankets for the soldiers in the field. Out of occupied areas, guerrilla soldiers and workers spirited tools and materials to the cooperative factories. Some equipment was set up as far as 1,500 miles from its starting point. So new types of machines were produced that could be used by the cooperatives under emergency conditions. In more than 2,000 of these cooperative workshops, 500 different articles are made for the Army, Red Cross, and civilian population. Thus, many refugees of China who had lost everything, even hope itself, were blessed with the gift of work and the chance to help their country win its fight for freedom. At this canvas cooperative, the day's production is ready for shipment to the armies in the field. The mule train starts out on its overland journey to the front lines. Medical supplies for the hospitals and first aid stations are prepared, and surgical dressings for the wounded. The Red Cross takes on the cargo, and in the battle zones, nurses bring in the wounded from the field. Seldom do they have anesthetics or sulfur drugs, but they do with what they have. Here is a retreat for soldiers who have been wounded or disabled in action. These patients have rejoined the fight on the production front. Millions of young men like these have given their lives for the defense of China. Millions of young men. No other nation has paid a greater price for freedom. The faces of fighting China. Good comrades for us to have in this gigantic war we fight in Asia and Pacific. The leader of fighting China, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. And the heart of fighting China, Chongqing capital city of a nation that remains after seven years of war, unconquered and unconquerable. Three times the bombs have leveled nearly every building here, and each time a new Chongqing has sprung from the terror and the ruin and the ashes and carried on the fight. Yes, Chongqing still stands by the Yangtze, a vibrant symbol of the millions and millions of China who fight the good fight with us and who will keep the faith with us in victory and in peace.